Matthew chapter 5. And as, as I mentioned at the outset this morning, I was, I was going to go a different direction, but in light of some current events, which I will explain to some detail now, although I won't spend hopefully too much time talking about it, because I think there's more important things to discuss in light of it, uh, I thought it was necessary. You know, sometimes we are, we are an expository church, you know, we go verse by verse and we seek to go book by book. Through the entire, I mean, I would love to one day reach the status of somebody like a Dr. John MacArthur, which I know is probably a fool's earned, but the idea of preaching through the entire New Testament and Lord willing, and he gives me that much time to live, maybe I will one of these days. So, but we're starting with Galatians, but every so often something happens in the society, in the culture, whether writ large or in your own backyard, that requires, uh, I think, I think a little bit more extensive touch. And I labeled today's sermon, Persecution a Christian's inevitable and blessed experience. I did, I mean, it wasn't a similar message, but I remember preaching at um, the chapel where the school I taught at once on 2 Timothy 3.12, which we'll talk about this morning on the unpopular promise of Scripture. You know, we love to talk about all, the, all these wonderful blessings that await us. And by the way, they are. And even though persecution is promised to us, we're going to see this morning that there is a blessing even in the midst of the pain and as a result, even, even after the pain then, so to speak. But, you know, it's not a promise that we usually like to declare from the housetops, like, come to Christ, everybody's going to hate you. No. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, not, it's not usually a very good draw card. Like I said, I'm a terrible salesman, okay? Because <laughs> I believe in telling people the truth, and that's what I'm here to do with you today, is not to sugarcoat it, and not to try to develop some kind of program or some kind of slick way to proclaim to you what God's Word says. I just want to give it to you as it is, and allow the Holy Spirit not allow, but but bend to the Holy Spirit as He makes it applicable in your own hearts and lives. So I want to talk about the push to transgress, if I could, the push to transgress. You know, people in our society today, not just today, but really probably one might make the argument ever since what's called the Gilded Age in American history, we have sought to be a people of progress, right? Whether it's manifest destiny out to the West Coast, or some of us tongue-in-cheek call the left coast today, or some other kind of push, the Industrial Revolution, we in the West and in modern society have seen ourselves as a people of what? Of progress and advancement. And many of the cultural situations that happen even in our day, regardless of whether or not we've actually tested them to see if they're really progressing us forward as a society, we just slap the label on it. Why? Because it's different. Because it's not like stuck in the old traditional past of your stodgy church that maybe you grew up in or synagogue or whatever, you know. And so we tend to put the blanket seal of approval on things that happen within our culture that are new and different. We say, well, this is progress. But is it really? So the reason why I went this direction, some of you may be aware of this, about a couple of weeks ago, it came to my attention that a certain business establishment in our small town of Zillianople here was going to be hosting a brunch today, all in the name of charity, but hosting a brunch today in which things of a questionable nature would be celebrated and promoted. Specifically, and I want to be careful, because I know I have young ears in here, so I want to be careful what I say and how I say it, but something that they're calling a drag queen brunch. And if you're not familiar with what that terminology means, it's basically men dressing up in a cartoonish fashion, uh, basically looking like, I hate to say it this way, facsimiles of women, but in clown form. I don't know how else to say it. I know I know. in my description of it, I'm kind of revealing my hand of what I really think about it, but I'm trying to once again be careful in the type of terminology I'm employing here to describe this. Anyway, this business is was hosting this drag queen brunch on a Sunday. And in fact, it, today is that Sunday from 11 till 4 o'clock this afternoon. And so this is something that you know, and, and one of the brothers in here says this, you know, you, you see these kinds of things happening on the news in, in, in cities and in towns seemingly far away, in a galaxy far away. And you say, well, that'll never happen here until it does. And until you're forced to basically make a judgment call on it, you know. And by the way, if I could just say as an aside, all these people say, well, don't, don't judge, don't judge. We're called not to judge. 
That in and of itself is a statement of judgment. It's a self-defeating argument. We're all called to judge. We judge all the time. When you walked in here this morning, you judged which chair looked the most comfortable out of all these uncomfortable chairs, and you said, I'm going to plop down there, right? So, so you made discernment and judgment when you walked in here today. You're making it right now on the words I'm speaking, whether or not I'm saying anything that smacks of truth or whether or not you're going to be thinking about something else. All of us are called to be discerning and judgmental. So the question is, who makes the proper judgments? And it's in the estimation, for instance, of our church here and our leadership here that this business in bringing in these things is not making a proper judgment that is going to be conducive to promoting things that the Bible would see as proper ethics and morality in this community. Well, what are we going to do about it? Listen to Ben Shapiro complain? Or are we going to do something about it? Well, we decided we would do something about it. So we went to the town council here, and we, we presented our reasoning for why we stood opposed to this. And one of the reasons why, one of the salient points I want to make about what I said to the council after I introduced myself, and of course thanked them and said it's wonderful to be in this community. We love this community. I love Zillianople. You know, my wife was born in Butler. I, I wasn't born in western Pennsylvania, but, you know, I've been around here in Butler County long enough to really feel like out of all the places, I've said this to Sarah many times, of all the places I've ever lived, this place feels the most like home. It just does. Probably part of my upbringing as well, but it does. It feels the most like home. So I love this place. And in, pre in presenting this to the council and telling them that this was something that wasn't going to be good for the environment for our community, I said, I know our detractors, that just means somebody who disagrees with you and comes against you. I know our detractors will see what we're saying and the arguments we're presenting and say, oh, that's a slippery slope argument, right? That's not really going to happen. You know, what they're saying up here, nobody's going to do that. Nobody's looking to introduce this to, say, children. Nobody's looking to, you know, take over the community. We're not at, we just, we just want the ability to practice how we feel is right, doing what's right in our own eyes, Judges 21, 25. But my point was that the slippery slope is actually very, most definitely real. I said, all you have to do is look at culture in our society writ large, wherever it may be, and you can see that when these kinds of things are not just allowed, but even allowed an opportunity to be celebrated, it typically starts going in the direction of allowing other types of prurient interests, we might say, to come into a community. And it's our opinion that that is destructive. Well, unfortunately, the very concern that I presented was indeed realized. And I'll read you a quote from their Facebook page. They said this, quote, we've received an overwhelming amount of love, support, and requests to expand this event. So we're going to open up our outdoor area for anyone who wants to show up against the hate. I have this bullet in my notes. That's why I'm making a big deal about it. So I'm going to come back to it. Against the hate our business and staff have received for hosting our main event. Show up to show your support for an inclusive Zillianople. Show up to show your support for the LGBTQIA plus community. Our business is a safe and inclusive space for all to be who they are. We won't hide from hate, and neither should you. That's taken directly from their Facebook page. And what this came, when I read this, it came to my mind, really Christianity, the Christian religion, the Christian faith, Born again evangelicalism, however you want to package what we're talking about here, being a believer in Jesus Christ and asserting that his word is the standard for life and society, for home and for the church, that that is not only seen as passe, but it's purposely being attacked and mischaracterized, maligned in this increasing what many Philosophers are referred to as this post-Christian American culture. We used to say postmodern. Some people say post-postmodern. You know, the idea where truth is relative and truth is what you make of it and your truth is your truth. It may not be necessarily my truth. These types of thoughts. And now we're in this post-Christian era of Western culture and specifically American culture and society. And the reason why we call it post-Christian is because at one time, 
we at least had a civic sense of a civic religion that was built upon a Judeo-Christian ethic, and that even if people weren't all born-again Christians within our, our country, they all understood that the Bible is really the best roadmap for how a society ought to be run, that churches, for instance, being standard-bearers of that and proclaimers of that, were the ones who were holding forward that banner to say, this is the truth, and did so unashamedly. And as a side note, I think, unfortunately, a lot of churches, in an attempt to just try to pack people in and give them little, as John MacArthur would say, sermonettes for Christianettes, and basically dumb down the truth or water it down so much that it's not offensive to anybody, there are many who profess to be followers of Christ who aren't prepared for this collision. They're just not. They don't think biblically. They don't understand how to make category distinctions based on the fact they've been made in the image of God and therefore can understand what a man is and what a woman is, for instance, as we mentioned briefly last week, and so therefore they are unequipped to do so. Many of whom maybe had a Christian experience but never really met the Christ. They're sitting in churches and they're claiming to be born again, and yet they're no more saved than they're not. But the thing I want to point out, I, I, I'm going too long on this and I apologize, but if, just a couple of things I want to point out about the statement that this organization made, this business establishment. A couple of things to point out to see this growing conflict and collision. Number one, they refer to the LGBTQIA plus community. Biblically speaking, there is no such thing. Sure, there are people who will identify themselves in these kinds of alternative fashions, which really actually the, the real alternative today is to be not this, it seems, but they'll fashion themselves in all kinds of alternative fashions, and they'll say, well, we're a community. But biblically speaking, there is no gay community, just like there's no murdering community and no adulterous community, no thieving community. Although some may think the American government is all of those communities, the point is, is that there is no community that can be defined that way biblically. And why do they say that? Because it's a rejection of what God says is the only, only valid way to understand human ontology, which is a big word that means to be, what it means to be human, and anthropology, what it means to be decidedly a man, or of the human race, we might say. The second thing they say, I want you to pick up from their quote, is this idea of a safe and inclusive space. Safe and inclusive space. So this, therefore, then insulates them and protects them from any who would call out such open celebration of perversion against God's design and therefore insulate them from anybody coming to them to bring up the gospel call to repent and believe in Christ. And ironic, really, when you think about it, because would we, as biblical Christians, be able to exist in that inclusive space? No. But in the world of tweets and these, 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 these kind of amorphous maxims that don't really have any root in reality, but beyond what the emotional person wants to put forward as, quote unquote, their truth, what can you say? There's no foundation there. The emperor has no clothes. And then thirdly, against the hate. And that's probably one of the more distressing ones. Against the hate. This is actually, I think, open retaliation against those who refuse to go quietly and or celebrate such vileness. We won't hide, and neither should you. Be ready, because we're ready to fight. Those are the kind of words that are being used in such a way to insulate themselves from not only hearing the gospel, but anybody who would come to them and say, I love you in the name of Christ, and I want to tell you that your celebration of perversion is wrong. You're hating me. You're saying I shouldn't exist because this is who I am. You're telling me I don't have a right to exist as this LGBTQIA person. You're saying that that very existence is sinful. And we say, no, your existence is not sinful. You're made in the image of God. You have dignity and worth because of the way you have been made and fashioned after the likeness of your creator. You've gone astray, and I'm trying to call you back. I'm trying to call you back to your creator who made you, who made you in love and care. That's Psalm 139 says. But 
in, in our world today, there's like this, this wall that has gone up. That people can't even think clearly about this, who belong to that side of the quote-unquote spectrum anymore. And unless you celebrate it, march with it, allow it to have its way in whatever way it wants, in any facet of society it wants to have it, then you're the hater. You're the bad guy. In fact, I was talking to my old pastor friend down in North Carolina. And he said to me, he said, just, he's like, Mike, you, you know, you're the bad guy. I said, I know. I, I don't like being the bad guy. I like when people like me. I don't want people to call me names. I know many of you don't want people to call you names here either. But I'm going to tell you this. Nobody in this world will ever call you a worse name than our Lord took on our place. Nobody in here will ever disparage you and mock you and insult you and hate you like our Lord was hated. And when Jesus said, take up the cross and follow after him, he didn't say to go get a sweet tat down at the tattoo parlor or go get a big gold chain. Nothing wrong with those things. Actually. My point is, is that taking up the cross means going on the death march for the cause of Jesus Christ and being willing to suffer no matter what the end especially in such a transgressive society in which we live, persecution, therefore, and we'll define that term in the course of my message, should be accepted and embraced, accepted and embraced as not only a very real uh, possibility, if not a probability of the Christian's experience, but a source and sign of the eternal God's blessing on one's life. As Jesus himself said, if the world loved you, you would belong to the world, but I called you to be different from the world and not to be like the world. So that raises the question, why should we understand persecution as normal for the Christian's life and experience? And furthermore, how can we endure it, not as victims, but overcomers as the saints of old have done? Understanding that our God is sovereign, and has a reason for all that he ordains and allows, even the evil in this world, like Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. To even bring many people alive today. I hope, therefore, in the light of this and the spirit of this, to examine Jesus' words at the end of this section that we call the Beatitudes and see three things. The heritage of persecution for the believer, that heritage we belong to, the inevitability of the persecution we will indeed face, and finally, the blessing of persecution for those who have been called of God to endure as he did to their everlasting reward and to his everlasting glory. Uh, my introduction went a little long. I apologize for that, but there's so much to say and so much more could be said, but I ask if you're able to rise with us for the reading of God's word we are once again in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. Our Lord says in these last two Beatitudes to the people who are gathered on the mount, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the reading of God's word. May you be seated. Let's pray. Father, what a weighty subject and a weighty text and some very great and precious truths that are before us here in your holy word. I pray that you would help us to grow in an understanding of what it is that you're communicating to us this morning, that we may take what you said to your people 2,000 years ago and be able to apply it to our lives not only here in this community, but from all the communities that are represented in here, that we may see this idea of persecution 
as not only the badge that we are to wear, but also the cross that we are to bear and our entrance into glory. May we be willing to endure all things for the sake of your elect and that therefore Jesus Christ would be in all and through all and receive the maximal amount of glory for our lives. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. So let's start with a couple of definitions. I love definitions. As some of you know, my background is in philosophy before I was in seminary, and if we can't define our terms, then we don't know what exactly we're talking about or even what position we should argue against. So let's talk about persecutions this morning. So this word to persecute in our present context, diaco, really can be used to hasten towards an objective or to pursue. In this context, it means to harass someone, especially because of their beliefs. That's how it's used in our present passage. Therefore, persecution, this is actually in your notes, persecution is a decided, deliberate, and determinative attack, either verbal or physical, meant to demean, diminish, or destroy someone else or some other entity, either physically, that is, bring about bodily harm, or non-physically through, say, character assassination. This is the way persecution should be understood in Jesus' words here. Persecution, therefore, is not, and I want you to get this, persecution is not disagreement or ignorant actions precipitated by a legitimate misunderstanding or lack of information, okay? But it is a willful, targeted hatred expressed through violent words and or actions meant to purposely and unjustly misunderstand, misrepresent, and malign. In other words, purposely meant to shut up and shut down. So as we mentioned, this context, the Sermon on the Mount, which actually begins in verse 1 of Matthew 5 and goes all the way to chapter 7, verse 29. And this is a message that Jesus had preached to those who were following after him. And in this, he is kind of laying out almost like a new Moses another understanding, and actually the true understanding, of not only the Mosaic law that had come before, but even in some instances, an expansion upon it. And we see this when Jesus says, you have heard it said to those of old, but yet I say to you this. One example is, you've heard it say, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but Jesus said in Matthew 6, I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who what? Who persecute you, okay? So it's actually within that, this same context. These beatitudes, I think these are probably some of the most misunderstood aphorisms or statements in the entire New Testament. They've been used by people, say, in the social justice movement to encourage people to go sell everything they have because blessed are the poor in spirit. So therefore, the rich aren't getting into heaven. So you need to give over everything and make yourself a pauper. But really, actually, what these are, these statements of blessedness, which is what beatitude means, it's a statement of blessedness, a statement of favor upon a certain individual, these are characteristics of kingdom citizens. In other words, if you belong to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ, then these things are true of you. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who understand that they are impoverished and without God in this world and therefore are in need of his presence and his forgiveness and his righteousness. So these aren't things to try to gin up in yourself to become. These are statements of reality for the believer, for the kingdom citizen. So these nine general statements of blessedness concludes with these last two, and actually the ninth builds directly upon this eighth, and they're both dealing with persecution. So that's fine, but what does it mean to be blessed? You know, I've seen like these shirts on hashtag blessed. And I'm like, I wonder if the person with the hashtag blessed shirt is actually like, yes, I'm so blessed that people hate me for the cause of Christ. But in actuality, that's true. That's true. So what does it mean to be blessed? Makarios is the word here, and it means something pertaining to being especially favored by somebody else, which results in happiness, which results in joy and contentment in light of the fortunate experience that one is undergoing. And even further here, privileged recipients of divine favor. And each of the eight follow this kind of same pattern. Blessed are you because of this. Blessed are you because of that. 
Therefore, each one of these blessed statuses, or stati, I don't know, we'll go with statuses, for each state is described by the because that indeed follows. Okay, so now we have our definition. We're talking about persecution. We're talking about being blessed. Jesus here says, blessed are those who have been persecuted, which leads us to my first point, and that is the heritage of persecution. Notice our Lord here says blessed, and that blessed, by the way, is emphasized. It starts off every one of these sentences. How do I know it's emphasized? Well, because normal Greek word order goes verb, subject, object. Here we have the object being fronted before the verb itself. Blessed. In fact, the verb isn't even there. It's implied. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. So this gives us the idea that Jesus has people in mind that this has already happened to. Blessed are the ones who have been persecuted. And why indeed were they persecuted? Well, he tells us, for the sake of righteousness. Now, the question today is who defines righteousness? Is it cultural? When we had our conversation, actually, because me and, and Brother Phil actually had a conversation with the two owners, the co-owners of this restaurant after the council meeting. It was a bit of fireworks, but at the end of the day, it was, it was ended amiably enough, or amicably enough. And the point that kept being put to us was, we're just trying to represent common human decency. Common human decency. And the question I kept coming back to for them was, by what standard do you judge, judge something decent or right? In a similar fashion, there was, I just saw this on the news, the LA Dodgers were hosting a Pride Night here in the next few weeks, and they actually disallowed or disinvited another one of these drag groups to come and ply their trade or whatever at the events. And the reason why is because they were purposely mocking Roman Catholic nuns. And so there were Catholics there who took a stand and said, stop mocking our religion, essentially. And they actually had a senator, Senator Marco Rubio from Florida, weighed in on it as well. And one of the protesters from these nuns, from this blasphemous group, was holding up a sign that said, uh, "Love something like love triumphs over evil. I said, that's interesting. So I thought to myself, who defines what's evil? Who defines what's righteous? And interestingly enough, these two owners were not able to give a satisfactory answer to the question. In fact, in typical fashion, if you've ever talked to like an atheist before, they use what I call, they employ what I call a brute force tactic, or they just say, oh, come on, we all know it's like this. No, 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 you're not going to get away that quickly. How do we all know it's like this? Oh, come on. No. You see, we're people of truth as Christians. And therefore, how we know what we know and what we're going to base our understanding of a right family, a right church, a right society, a right government, a right country, a right world is going to be based on the one alone who determines and defines what's right at all. And that's the God whom we serve, the God of righteousness. Now, you can argue with that. You can disagree with that, but you got to deal with it. Jesus is the one who determines what indeed is righteous and righteousness. So biblically speaking, then, righteousness is all that is in accord with and flows from God's own being and character. He defines it, not human culture, not human opinion, nor human desire. The only thing that's common about human decency is if God, in his common grace, has allowed for that definition to be in accord with his word. That's it. So what are some examples of those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, which I mentioned previously is a mark that you don't belong to this world, but you belong to another? Well, you could keep your hand here in Matthew 5, and I was going to do a little bit more jumping around the scriptures than I was planning on, but for the sake of time, I'm probably going to cut some of that out. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35 to 38, I think that we see exactly who are the ones or some of the ones that Jesus has in mind here. Because actually, and I'll make you jump again, you don't have to jump, but at the end of verse 12, it says, in the same way they did what? They persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the prior prophets are an example for those who were undergone persecution. So what are some examples? And well, let's look at verse, uh, verses 35 to 38 of Hebrews chapter 11. 
actually the end of verse 35 says, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and floggings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in desolate places and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Hardly sounds like subjects of a glorious kingdom. And yes, that is what they are. That is what they are. And all these having gained approval through what means? Through their faith did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect or complete. This is in reference to the prophets themselves who were hated by the nation of Israel. And why were they hated? Well, let's go down a Rolodex here. That's probably not the right term, but let's go through it. Moses, and I'm not going to go to these passages, but I'll mention them if you want to mention them as cross references for you to check um, after, after the service or maybe during family devotion this week. Moses, actually Hebrews 11, 23 to 26, tells us that Moses specifically targeted for embracing the people of the patriarchs, his fellow Israelites, his Hebrews, those people that God chose to bless and protect over and against all other peoples. We have the example of Elijah. Not this Elijah, but Elijah in the Bible. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1 to chapter 19, verse 8, who was specifically targeted for calling out the evil of wicked King Ahab and his pagan wife Jezebel, including mass idolatry of his age, to the point where he was crying out to God in desperation, saying, Lord, there's nobody left. Do you ever feel that way? You ever feel that way at work? You ever feel that way maybe in your neighborhood? I'm the only one left. I'll tell you what, we felt that way at the council meeting. There were three of us, three of us. There is a church on every single corner in this town. And there were three of us saying, this is wrong. This is evil. My frustration isn't actually even so much pointed at those who are dead in their sins and going along like dead salmon downstream the way of this wicked and godless culture. My irritation is for us in the church who, excuse me, who claim to be leaders, who claim to be advocates of righteousness and the gospel, and we're too afraid to say, thus saith the Lord, because we're afraid that this will be our end. Well, we're not getting around it. We're not getting around it. It is coming to our communities, to our homes, and it's been there in the wings just waiting for the opportune moment. Then the serpent strikes when our defenses are down. So Elijah was persecuted and left alone for that. We think of Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 20 to 22, who was actually killed. And why was he killed? Did he steal from the king? Did he subvert the government of his day? Well, perhaps because the government of his day was what? Godless, like so many of the kings were in Israel's history. He was killed because he called out the people of his day for trespassing Yahweh's commandments and forsaking him. And for it, he paid with his life. Isaiah. Now, we don't know what happened to Isaiah specifically, but according to Jewish tradition, when the writer to the Hebrews says they were sawn in two, Isaiah may be who the writer to the Hebrews had in mind. Because according to Jewish tradition, Isaiah was literally sawn in two under wicked, wicked Judahite king, King Manasseh, for his own prophetic proclamations. And yet we know Isaiah is the prophet of peace, the prophet of hope, the one who is proclaiming the coming of this one who's going to take upon the sins of Israel upon his shoulders. And he was killed for that, potentially. We have Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 37, uh, verse 11 to chapter 38, verse 13 is the example I'm thinking of who was imprisoned and tossed into a miry cistern with no water. He's sinking down in this cistern with no relief. And why? Why was, he, why was that done to him? Because he spoke the truth of God's word against a compromising King Zedekiah. And finally, I mentioned just biblical examples. John the Baptist himself in Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 to 12, who was beheaded for calling out sexual deviancy of the people in power. That one hits close to home. And Herod and Herodias, who wasn't even his wife. He says, it is not lawful for you to have her. 
off with his head. Not to mention Paul himself, who we've been reading in the book of Galatians, who also underwent a martyr's death. And I could have went through a whole, I mean, it's a sermon all by itself. It's probably a series of sermons. It's a, it's a class on the history of martyrs. And by the way, the word martyr, martyros in the Greek, it didn't mean one who died for their faith. It just meant simply a witness, one who bore testimony to a truth, most likely in a court of law. But it became synonymous with one who sealed their testimony with their own life which is why we call them martyrs. You can go through the history of the church and see martyrs. We could go to modern day, 2023, go to Morocco, go to Pakistan, go to North Korea, go to China, and see the people who are calling to give all for the cause of the gospel, and some of them do. Fathers who are killed, leaving their wives without a husband, and children without a father. Women being killed, leaving their children without parents, orphaned, and destitute. This is going on now. Not here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But it is. It's going on now. So what's the common denominator? All of these were persecuted. Why? For choosing God's word and his ways over the wisdom and wiles of this present world system of permissiveness and perversion speaking truth to those enslaved to, as Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians, the God of this age who has blinded them from believing the true gospel message. And this includes, by the way, brethren, rulers, authorities, and world forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, who lead their citizens to purposefully, purposefully, misunderstand and malign the true righteousness of God, leading them to call, as Isaiah 5 says, what's evil good and good evil. And we'll slap a, we'll slap a sanctifying seal of approval and say, well, they're professional. They know what they're doing. So do we, and that's why we're standing against it. Because we become part of that heritage. In John's gospel, John chapter 15, verses 18 to 20, John says this, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world because of this, this, my choosing of you, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will pers also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Now we know Jesus is saying that specifically to the disciples, but we share in their heritage, which is probably why Jesus in his high priestly prayer of John 17 prayed for all of us who would believe on the testimony of the disciples that we would hold fast, that we would stay strong, that we would not go quietly in the night, but lovingly proclaim from the housetops, thus saith the Lord. If our Christianity, if what we're calling Christianity is at home with this world system, then it is not true Christianity. This is because true servants of God will always, always be purposely misunderstood and hated by those who have deliberately chosen to deny and disregard his law and his love. It isn't an issue of whether or not we'll do battle. Because of our allegiance to King Jesus, who stands diametrically opposed to the present King Satan of this fallen world system, we are involved in spiritual war, whether we like it or not. Did you know you signed up for that? When you repented and believed and you were baptized and you joined the church that you joined in the past when God saved you, did you know that it was a call to war? Because it is. Not only against our own flesh, which is our primary enemy, but against the devil and against a world system that desperately needs the gospel, desperately needs to hear it. Because guess what? We all were part of that system too at one point. We all belong to this evil wickedness of this present age and God in his grace saved us. And he used people who were willing to endure persecution for the sake of his elect to tell it to us. People who themselves were, were, were maybe wringing their hands before they went to work that day. I really, I really mean to be talking to my, my coworker, but I'm really scared to do so. I don't know how they're gonna receive it. 
or at the dinner table, right? I've, I've got these relatives and man, they're always on about this. No, 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 wait, that's the other side. I've got this relative and he doesn't, he or she doesn't know the Lord. And I, I'm really trying to reach out to them and I just don't know how they're going to take it. And, and oh, I just hope I say all the right words, wringing their hands and breaking their own hearts for the cause of their king. They did it for us and now we're called to do the same. Which leads us to the inevitability of persecution. Coming back to Matthew 5. Notice Jesus says, blessed are you when, when they mock you. A time indicator, right? Not blessed are you if they mock you, but blessed are you when they mock you and persecute you and speak all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. And the me there Jesus uses in the original text is emphatic. On account of me. Not account of you, but on account of me because you're identified with me. You're in me. You're my subject, not theirs. So in other words, once again, it's bound to happen. Even though the verb in the original Greek is what we call subjunctive, which is the, which is the mood of possibility, it should not be understood as slightly potential, but inevitably potential. John 16, 33a, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. As I mentioned in the beginning of my message, 2 Timothy 3.12, the unpopular promise of Scripture, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. And by the way, if you call yourself a Christian and you are not desirous to live godly in Christ Jesus in some way, then I can tell you on the authority of God's holy word, you are not a Christian. All who desire to live godly for Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You will. And in our world, it may happen in your place of employment. You get passed over for a promotion. You're fired. I had an instance one time at a job I worked at where because I was speaking about my faith and witnessing to people there, I had a supervisor who shut me down, who said, you can't bring a Bible into work anymore. I don't want you to listen to Christian music anymore. I mean, it got to the point, I was ready to call old Jay Seculo over at the ACLU, if you know what I'm talking about. I actually did. And, and they said, well, it's such a small business that it's going to be hard to marshal in support of you. So I ended up leaving that job. And I tried reasoning with him. I said, you got a picture of Gandhi on your office wall. Well, we're not here to talk about that. I said, I know. <laughs> I'm just trying to point out your inconsistency. That's all I'm trying to say. So that, but that might be the way you're persecuted in this climate in which we live. You know, it could be people that you just hang out with. They don't want to hang out with you anymore. And some of us have experienced all this. So I won't belabor it. But let's talk about it a little bit more. How do they express their hatred, biblically speaking, in the text here? Well, first, mocking. And this word mocking here means to find fault in a way that demeans. And it could actually be, it could be an, an honest mockery, right? You're weird. You do weird things because you're a Christian. I'm going to mock you for it. Got to read my Bible. Or like, or like I heard from one of the owners at this establishment just because I don't worship your bleeping sky, daddy. Yeah, I had the same response. I was, man, I was lit up. Or as the kids say, I was lit. But I think that, I think that means something. I was triggered. I was triggered. I was triggered. <laughs> now I'm mocking. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, so, so basically finding fault in a way that means, you know, basically reviling, heaping insults by way of shaming. Sky daddy. You know, you worship this, this fairy tale, this fantasy. Does this individual have any idea what he's talking about? No, he's completely ignorant. And when it comes to the way and word of God, he sounds, and I'm going to use a harsh word here, and I hope you don't mind, but sometimes we got to speak harsh truth. He was being stupid. That is the textbook definition of it. Also, ignorance. Speaking of things that he has no idea what he's talking about. But that's mockery. Persecution. Now, we already gave the definition, but just to reiterate, pursuing that one finds deplorable because of who they are or what they believe, whether spoken or not. You know, everybody in the, the, the summer of love that was uh, 2020, in light of all the George Floyd riots, you had, you had buildings being burnt down. You had government people being, you know, basically put on, uh, you know, incredibly nervous and anxious. We had a, a friend of ours down in North Carolina who was a, who was a uh, Raleigh police officer who actually was injured during a protest and he actually had to, he was sidelined for a bit as a result of it. You know, that was all legitimate because that's, that, 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 that's indignation for past wrongs done supposedly. But what about, what about our society getting on all the abortion clinics that were threatened as a result of the overturning of Roe v. Wade? 
DOJ's disappeared on that one. Saying things like Jane's revenge, right? We know where you live, that kind of stuff. That That's okay, right? Why? Because darkness aligns within its own ranks in order to attack the light. Because darkness hates the light. And then finally, speaking evil falsely, Jesus says here, slandering the character and beliefs of someone else by attributing to them positions or acts that they do or not do, or put this way, that they do not hold to or do not do, nor ever have done or held to. I know it's kind of weird the way I said that, but I'll give you an example. Lumping all professing, outwardly professing Christians together with no attempt or desire to properly divine positions or people. And this is very big in our world today, which doesn't really care about individual truths and actually sitting for more than five seconds to actually hear a reasoned argument as to why somebody believes something or not. Our society is, 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 is the age of the tweet, which leads to the age of the narrative, right? You fit into this little box. If you're white, you're, 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 you're by guilt by association, right? If you're black, then you're, 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 you're automatically a victim, because of this, this infusion, I don't want to get too much into this, but this, this infusion of Marxist thinking, which, which sees everybody as haves, have-nots, bourgeoisie, proletariat, rich, poor, black, white, gay, straight, cisgender, blah, 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 whatever else, right? That's the way our culture is defining everything and putting it down. So when they see Christians... They don't make an attempt to delineate. So we can stand here against perversion, say, in our culture, and there'll be more than enough people to say, you're like those Westboro Baptist people. God hates, you know, all this other stuff. No attempt to make any kind of distinction between us. Because to them, you're all part of that same group that's against us. And really, it's anti-intellectual, but I'm not going to get into that. It's not as smart as people think it is. So what's the common denominator? Sticking to this, right? All of these attacks from haters of God are not rooted in truth or righteousness, but in malleable, that is, changeable maledictions, curses, and swearings meant to not actually get at truth at all, but merely discredit and destroy those who belong to Christ because what we're saying is what they don't want to hear. All of this is in fulfillment. If we went back to John 15. You don't have to turn there, but we went there. John 15, 21 to 25 says, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works, which no one else did, they would not have sinned, but now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But this happened to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause, without just cause, we could say. In a world, as I mentioned, desires for narrative and sound bites and tweets, there is very little room for that open, honest, and reasoned discourse. The extreme emotionalism and embroiled anger against Christianity that only seems to be growing in the West, we like to say, ensures that all of those marching under the banner of Jesus Christ will increasingly become targets in the present time at our places of work, at our schools, and even amongst ourselves with those who profess to follow Christ. Dr. John MacArthur got himself in a little bit of controversy yet again this past week. As I don't, I don't think this was a message he preached recently, but in the somewhat recent past, I preached about how the embracing of the LGBTQIA 21A plus agenda is, is an open exhibition of the reprobate mind, of which there's no coming back. And so some people took issue with that. They said, well, of course, there's always hope, right? Isn't there hope? And yeah, I think there is. But to MacArthur's point, if you read Romans 1, it says God gave them over. God gave them over. That doesn't mean everybody in America is given over or in Europe or in Russia or in China or in, or, or in any of the countries of Africa. It just means that to these that have fully embrace, and we don't know where that is in people's hearts, but to those who have fully embraced this and have imbibed it and, and they're given over to it, that is a judgment of God upon a nation. And I believe we are living in those times. I believe we're living in those times where this, what we see going on here and the open embracing and celebration of that which God says is clearly verboten, is dangerous for us, and is an affront to him, is a sign of judgment. 
So what is the hope in all of this then? Should we just, you know, do like the, you know, rapture ready of old would do and say, well, why polish the brass on a sinking ship? Let's just wait till Jesus comes. We'll just twiddle our thumbs and stay in our own homes. No, there's a blessing for those who are persecuted. Why are they blessed? My third point, the blessed persecution, we come to chapter five, verse 10, the second part of it, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If we are persecuted, we show a few things. Number one, we show that our home is God's eternally blissful abode, which is being prepared for us by our loving Savior. John 14, 1 to 4. Second point, that we have escaped the wrath of God through faith alone in his son, to which end he has brought us to. We are deeply loved and favored by the Father as a result of that. And thirdly, that one day we, now this is crazy, all right? I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. We will one day rule and reign with Christ in the millennium and in the eternal state. And Revelation 20, 4 to 6 tells us that. I know you're like, man, I could barely even get out of the house on time. I can't see myself ruling anything. I mean, that's, that's how I feel. But yet that's what God declares about his church. In fact, Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. These are commands, by the way, in the original text. These are commands. Rejoice and be glad. It's not a suggestion. It's finding your rejoicing, your contentment, your hope, and your joy, not in things going right for you in this world, but in one who has kept you and made you right in this world. And that's Christ. Because your reward, your reward, your reward, your reward, your reward in heaven is great. That word's emphasis. It's great. Okay, <laughs> I don't see that right now. None of us do. That's why this is by faith, right? Faith in things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. One who's gone before us and has gone beyond the veil to provide for us this eternal blessed hope. This reward here in the original text, recognition here by God, God recognizing for the moral quality of an action an affirmation of laudable content, conduct or praiseworthy conduct. In other words, our reward will be the recognition of God, of our lives and ministries lived and performed in obedience to him and in honor of the glory he deserves. Just as I said, every true Christian will want to live a godly life. So the desire of every true Christian to some degree in here should be this, to hear these words of our Lord. Because I'm going to tell you what, no ministry is perfect. I'm not perfect. This church isn't perfect. None of us are perfect. There's only one who is good. That's God alone. And yet still, that God takes my imperfect attempts to honor and glorify him, striving to present his text in a way that is understandable and applicable and meaningful for you, his precious loved sheep here. All I want to hear is well done, good and faithful servant. And if we're believers, that's what we should want to hear as well. What's the price of faithfulness? Carrying our cross. What's the promise for faithfulness? Eternal reward and ruling and reigning with Christ and under his loving care and guidance. Because time's escaping me, I'll just kind of wrap up here at the end a little bit quickly. Just want to mention a couple other benefits of persecution. Maybe you can hang your hat on here this week as you maybe are considering some of these things now. It could draw us closer to the Savior. I mean, consider the Psalms. We've been going through the Psalms every single week. And David is driven once again, over and over again to his knees and saying, you, God, are my rock. You are my shield. Not these things around me. As he's hiding out in these caves in En Gedi in the northern part of the land of Israel, in this inhospitable land, you're my defense. You're my rock. You're my joy, my comfort, my hope. I may lay my head on a rocky crag, but I know in heaven there's a mansion of glory. And so I'm not concerned for my present moment because you are faithful. It draws us closer to God, closer to the Savior. It trains its victims to endure all things for the sake of what? His elect. You know, now, we're, like I said previously, we're the ones who wring our hands and worry about how we're going to be taken by somebody else. But yet we go. Why? Because we love them. And because we want to be used by God to bring his sheep home. Just as Paul, when he received his vision of Macedonia, he was told, I think it was Macedonia. He was told by the Spirit of God, I have many people in this city being faithful for that purpose. Thirdly, it's used to help identify sheep and goats, finding out who the real Christians are. I don't know if this is a real story, but you've probably heard this anecdotal story. I think it was in like communist Russia 
where like these people busted into a secret church service and they had guns, you know, out and they're like, oh, if you're a Christian, you know, if you're not a Christian, you leave immediately, right? All these people scatter and they leave the, the worship service and then they turn their guns on the rest of the congregation who decide to be faithful and said, hey, we're going to pay with our life's blood. You know, we're going to seal our testimony with our blood. And the soldiers put their guns down. They said, we just want to see where the real Christians are. Like, I don't know if that's, that, that story's been told a bunch of times. It could be anecdotal, but man, it, 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 hits, it hits hard, right? It's good. It's really good because that's true. That's what persecution does. It helps us see who the real church is and who the false church is. And honestly, as another aside, I think that's exactly why the Lord, well, one of the reasons why the Lord is doing this in our culture today. And there's other things I could say on that, but I'll, I'll hold off. And then lastly, it can be used to help identify true and false doctrine. You know, what I'm trying to provide for us here anyway this morning is something of a theology of persecution, right? Knowing that's inevitable. So from a theological perspective, what does the Bible have to say about this? And therefore, how should we live our lives in, in, in light of it? So in conclusion, I have just a few expectations and, and not expectations I want to conclude my message with this morning. If you're a Christian in this room, expect persecution to be in your future. John 3.20, and I'll, I'll turn there. I wasn't going to, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn there. John chapter 3, verse 20, after John the Baptist had said to his disciples are in the same context, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. He has this to say, John chapter 3, verse 20. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. There are a lot of, I mean, a beautiful sunny day, as I said right at the outset. And yet there are a lot of people walking around in darkness, spiritual walking dead. And God has placed you in their lives to communicate the truth of the gospel but we will be persecuted for it. It's going to happen. Could be somebody say, get the bleep out of here. I don't want to listen to you. It could be something worse, but in any event, we should expect it. If you're a Christian, don't expect people to fight fair against what you believe and for the truth in which you stand. You know, think of the kangaroo court that Jesus himself endured and how conflicting testimony was employed to twist and turn his words against him in order to get to the desired end of killing him. I'm, I'm going I'm to read another quote. In fact, the, uh, one, of the, one of the co-owners of this business was actually interviewed by WPXI, and he had these comments to say about the condition of Zillianopol, or the people coming against his love fest. He said, quote, I think the summary of the threats are not violent, which is good. We definitely weren't threatening. It's more or less holding our business hostage to a few petty-minded folks who believe they can take our business away from us if we do something they don't approve of. Number one, nobody here wants to hold any business hostage. Number two, discarding 2,000 years of the history of the church and theological development and the vast amounts of manuscripts of New Testaments and even the history of the Old Testament and Jewish history before the time of Christ. I mean, all these things that go into our understanding of how God has worked redemptively in this world is hardly the subject for petty-minded people. And if somebody was willing to listen, they may be educated and understand just that, that we are not a petty-minded people. And then finally, take their business away. We got done telling them, we don't want anybody to take, we, I hear you make a good burger. Well, why haven't you been there? I said, because I can't afford an $11 to $15 burger. <laughs> I mean, quite honestly, and I don't really think about it, you know. But I, I said, I'd love to come to your establishment sometime. I hear you've got great food. So it has nothing to do with that. But once again, they're not fighting fair. And the reason why is because they're captive to the father of lies. You expect the father of lies to fight fair? He's going to throw dirt in our face. He's going to punch below the belt, and he's going to do everything he can and he needs to to win. But we cannot stoop to that level. Don't expect them to fight fair. Thirdly, if you're a Christian, expect that the Lord himself will fight with you and for you. John 16, the end of that verse says, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. You're in it. It hates you, but I've overcome it, so rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. 
If you're a Christian, don't expect the Lord to remain with you, though, if you seek to fight his battles on your terms and with your tools. Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And by the way, who defines what's good? It's God again, right? We should not be fighting the way the world does. Once again, if we're taking our cues predominantly from conservative media, much of which I agree with personally, but if we're taking our cues and how to fight spiritual battles by people who are not regenerate, not believers, then we're doing ourselves and the cause of the gospel, I fear, potentially. I fear potentially a disservice. We cannot do that. And then finally, if you're a Christian, know that the battle is already won. That's all the, I don't know if there's any Keith Green fans in here, but Keith Green's got some. The battle is already won. You know, the race has already been run, right? Christ is already the victor. All that remains is to be used by the captain of our salvation to take the ground that already belongs to him. And I'll end with this here, just a quick reading from the scriptures in 1 Peter chapter 4. I was thinking to myself, I got to put 1 Peter in here somewhere because 1 Peter is, is if, you're, if you're wanting to have a good devotional study on what it means to be a Christian enduring persecution, 1 Peter is the place and time fails me to get into the background. But I just want you to hear these words in chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you are sharing the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be put to shame, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who are suffering according to the will of God must entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing good. May God be blessed and praised to call us to be such a people that willingly take on the heritage of persecution, knowing that it is our lot facing the inevitability of a world that hates us and not responding in kind, but in the love of Christ, knowing the blessing that awaits us at the end because your reward in heaven is indeed great. Let's pray. Father, I thank you.